Good evening, everyone. That was a great trailer, wasn't it? All right. And uh, my name is Kelly Clement. I'm one of the programmers for the Docklands Film Festival and also program the documentary section in the, the main festival in the fall. And this is one of my favorite films in the festival, Layla at the Bridge. And we're presenting it with the support of Teresa Wolf. Let's give her a hand, because she's helped us out quite a bit in the festival. And this film's been getting a lot of attention out on the festival circuit and winning many awards, including the Social Justice Award at the Santa Barbara Festival. And it's also screening at Hot Docs and the Sheffield Film Festival and the Locarno Film Festival, some of the most prestigious documentary festivals out there. And it's, it's an exceptional story, really. Um, you know, we think we know a lot about what's going on in Afghanistan and the Middle East in general, you know, what we hear on the news. We've, we feel like we've got a handle on it. But this is a story that's going on that I'd never heard of. And it's a very, very powerful story. Um, and it's about a woman that's giving so much to other people. It's not your average doc. It's more of a riveting drama. And we're very happy to have the director here, one of the directors, actually, um, Elizabeth Mirzai. Hi, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, this film uh, I co-directed with my husband, Golestan, who is not here because he's watching our three-year-old back in Los Angeles. We, and I lived in Afghanistan for many years, and Golestan is Afghan, and so we really wanted to make a film that shows kind of a portrait of modern-day Afghanistan through the eyes and through the lens of this woman fighting a really epic problem. And it's a problem for which we're, I would say, all collectively responsible in a way. So that's, thank you for coming. Wonderful. We're really happy to be here at Docklands, too. Okay. Thank you for having us. Yeah. And you'll be back for the Q&A afterwards. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay, folks, stick around, enjoy Layla at the bridge, and we'll see you afterwards for the Q&A. I'd like to bring back the director, Elizabeth Brzee. It's amazing. Thank you. How long did you work on it? So we started it in 2012. We started filming, sure. and we... 2015, and then we did some pickups in 2016, uh -huh. 2017. Wow. Yeah. And you did uh, most of the camera work. Yeah, yeah. I was the DP on the film, and then we, just, for the pickup, I didn't go back to Afghanistan. We just had someone shoot, like, for a day, some uh -huh. extra shots. Yeah. But the access you got was incredible. How did you do that? Uh, I think it's, well, because it was just two of us, Golasan and I, and then, um, you know, we both speak the language, and, like, we lived there for a long time, and so I just think that that opened up a lot of doors for us, too. Yeah. Yeah. And they, and they just got used to you. Yes. Yes. Although, I mean, it's challenging under the bridge, because it's always changing, like, who's there, yeah. you know, at that time. So you don't, yeah. Did you feel in danger? Uh, of course, at times. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's the, dan the danger that exists for everyone being in Afghanistan, just like you don't know when something's going to happen. And so that's just the reality of life there. Um, there was a time when we did get followed by the police for a while because um, he thought we were doing like an expose on corruption and he was a corrupt police yeah. officer. So we had to stay away from the bridge for a while after that. But yeah. And where is she now? Layla's doing well. Um, she's been traveling with the film a bit. So she came to Switzerland. Uh, she was at, in Canada as well. She went to Norway recently. So she's gotten to travel around and bring the story to other people. And she is still in Afghanistan. Um, she has a new restaurant, same restaurant, but new location. I think they've moved like four times since this film. But uh, it's doing well. And she started like an enterprise where I think they're doing like making shoes now, people that have recovered from addiction and they're making leather shoes and selling them like pretty high-end nice shoes. So oh, she's, she's an entrepreneur. She's always coming up with something. She still has a lot of the same struggles that she did then. So that really hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, let me open it up to the audience. Yes, over there. I thought this was incredibly revealing about what the situation was there, but I'd like to go back in the film a bit where she, they have nothing to eat. Everyone that she comes in contact with, she owes money to. Mm -hmm. What happened then? I mean, it's never really stated in the film how suddenly she had money. Mm.
Um, yeah. Yes, that's a good question. So she did get donations occasionally. We did have one of them in the film, but it like it might be easy to miss. But like people, kind of like a rich businessman would kind of come along and say, I'm going to fund the treatment of this many people with addiction, and I'm going to give you this amount of money. And it would last for like however long that was for, and then she would have to go to get to the next person to try to fundraise. So it was just like an on and off kind of thing. And there was just these wealthy people that would want to jump in and support. And then there's a lot of times when no one did want to support. And it's still a challenge. She's still facing that challenge now. I have two questions. One, her do the daughters, she said, were refugees in Tehran. So I wanted to know a little bit about that, how they're doing, and what their situation is. And secondly, is she not using methadone because it's a philosophical thing, or it just doesn't have the finances, or they, they would abuse in those conditions there as with the methadone? Yes. Yeah, so the question was about her daughters, like a bit, a bit about the backstory about her daughter and two sons, and then who she said are refugees in Iran. And then the second part was why doesn't she use methadone in her treatment center? So her, um, she has the daughter and two sons. They were in Iran. They've actually all since gone to Germany, and they've sought asylum there. So they're all there right now, her three kids. Um, and then they think they're doing well. I haven't seen them, but um, Layla, I think, did visit them when she was out in Europe. And then methadone, it's really basically about the feedback that she gets from people who have who are struggling with addiction saying that when they use methadone then they come out of a treatment center addicted to something else and then so they're just like on the street now and a lot of them do deal with homelessness and they're just kind of like looking for their next fix of methadone so she just kind of took that feedback and incorporated it into it That's a good question. Uh, I would say that it's an illness. You know, that's kind of what the impression that I got over there, that it really is an illness, like much like other illnesses that we deal with, an illness that's a lot of times misunderstood. And that for me, I mean, for me filming it, like one of the hardest lessons for me to learn was that if a person doesn't want to stop, there's really nothing you can do. And so like that's that was the kind of understanding that I came to just with my experience, especially with Saeed Jamil in this film, like where Gosan and I, and Masuma as well, like wanted so much. And, and they did really want, like Saeed Jamil really wanted to stop. But I think that his addiction was too strong and he was too sick um, with the addiction as well as with HIV that it just like overcame, you know, and, and, and he lost his life to it. So that was, that's, yeah, I hope that answers your question, but I think it's a complex topic. And yeah. Um, when Layla, because of funds, elected to close the women's shelter, why would she close the women? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, she did that because the amount of women with addiction was a lot less than the amount of men, and she just basically made like a judgment, like I can help this many more men versus this many more women. And I think that she found personally that it was a harder challenge for her to work with women because they had they needed a lot more resources that she felt like she was pre prepared or able to give them, namely because they had been you know survivors of sexual assault and other kinds of trauma and, and been involved in prostitution, and they just needed a lot more assistance, but. Yeah, it's she has actually since reopened a new women's shelter, which is great. So, so another follow-up question on that: as you were filming, the mother who mm -hmm. gave up opioid to the baby, mm -hmm. I mean, did you just want to do something? Yeah, that's uh, that scene with Masuma and her daughter Nazanin. Like, I can't watch it now. And I think at the time, you know, like when I'm filming, um, like I'm just so used to just like something's happening and I have my camera running and we're just not prepared for a lot of things that are happening in the film. Like half the time I'm like, I can't even believe I'm, this is unfolding before the camera, especially like in the government ministries. Like how am I getting this kind of access? So it was just like kind of been used to that. And that was after not seeing Masuma for three years that we filmed that scene. Um, 
And then, you know, like we, after that, we, when we realized what was happening, we really tried to intervene off camera for that, for her. And she, she wouldn't accept it. Like we had found a family that was going to take the daughter and raise her until, and help Masuma support her to, you know, reco- in recovery. And she didn't accept it. And then we, she disappeared. So it's really, it was, um, yeah, something that I'm still processing now, especially as a mother myself. <laughs> My next project is uh, in Los Angeles. It's about uh, restorative justice in the prison system in California. And where are you at? Uh, I'm pretty, uh, I've been filming for a while. It's about two years now, uh-huh. so I've still got more to go, but. And you're working with your husband? Or? No, he's producing it and I'm, I'm directing it. Uh-huh. Yeah, he's too busy to, <laughs> to go direct with me right now. Uh-huh. Yeah. And how long do you think it'll It'll be. Hopefully not five years <laughs> like this film. <laughs> yeah, hopefully a lot sooner. So we'll be able to see it. Yes, I hope so. Okay. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> okay. I'm wondering if uh, the production of this film and showing it around the world um, has helped raise any funds uh, for this project. Yes, it has. Thank you for that question. Yes. Um, it has. We did set up a GoFundMe account for Layla, and so all the proceeds from that go directly to her. So people have been donating directly to there, as well as in the course of bringing the film. Like when we went to Hot Docs, we had like a dinner and a fundraising dinner for her, and then she's been doing fundraising, like meeting with people and officials and of governments when she's been traveling. So it has helped. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. Yeah. And do you have that the GoFundMe? Oh yeah. If you, I think if you just go Google like. GoFundMe Layla Addicts, then that would come up. Yeah. I noticed the American prisons were downgraded. Is that an accurate depiction? Is there, or was that just for the film, or is there actually well, not as many guys there as I thought? Uh, yeah, so there, so do you read the question? Was the American presence downplayed in the film or is that just the way it is? You know, I think what we tried to show in this film is that like there's a disconnect so between the American presence and what's actually happening on the ground. And so it's kind of subtle, but like, you know, we thought like a helicopter going overhead or like a tank just driving past. And it's these moments where it's like an intersection of two cultures, but there's not any connection there. And that was kind of what my interpretation and my, my experience was witnessing that there. So there was certainly less and less troops present over the course of the film. They were trickling out of the country, you know, during that. So there were more initially, but there was just that disconnect that I was trying to portray. And did you have interaction with them? Americans? Yeah. Uh, In my time in Afghanistan? Yeah. Not really in this film at all. Right. Yeah. But casually? Sometimes. Socially? Yeah. I mean, I managed a restaurant and bar there, so, like, Americans would come in there sometimes. But, Yeah. Kind of minimal. But they weren't really aware of the situation. You know, I feel like I I think, for example, a lot of Americans at that time, if they worked in the U.S. Embassy, they would literally, there was a point, and it might be still the case, where they would take a helicopter from the embassy to another location like five minutes away. You know, because they were, it was that 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 bad on the ground for them as Americans. But it's also, but it's not just as Americans, as Americans with the embassy. I think that, and so... I don't know. I think that there's like a lack of when you can't interact with people in the country you're in, then how can you really understand and, and try to legislate for policy or change if you're not if you don't have any relationships with the people on the ground? That's a good question. I don't know. I mean, they we really thought the end of this film was going to be the government giving her this new plot of land and that she was going to be building the new treatment center with the money that the Embassy of Japan had, had said that they would give to her as long as she got the land. And that just never happened. So even though they made that promise that they were going to support her, it just didn't happen. And now it's 2019. So, yeah, fortunately. Mm-hmm. And that seems like the underlying real root cause, besides the, the drug itself, 
Yeah. Yes. Yes, I mean, that's, that's very accurate. That's a huge problem. And that's part of what she was trying to address with like this idea of her being a mother and the follow-up that she felt that they were not getting at other treatment centers, like government-run centers, that it's like, I'm here for you. After you leave, I'll be here for you. But still, like, there's the economy is really bad there. There's like no jobs, you know, security is deteriorating. And it's hard enough, I'm sure, to get off heroin in San Francisco, you know, and then you compound all these other factors on top of it in Afghanistan, it just makes it like really quite, yeah, almost impossible. Yeah, so the question was about the Taliban and, and how her efforts could be impacted if they were to gain more power. I mean, we saw the, the main thing that we saw was that her business went down in the restaurant as a result. And you can't really pin it specifically on the Taliban because there's so many other, like, kind of insurgent groups, you know, and people, like, taking responsibility for things. So that impacted people just wanting to go out to eat in the restaurant at all. And then that had an effect on how many how she was able to finance her treatment center. Um, we did actually do an interview with a Taliban official that we didn't include in this film because we wanted to kind of put it into context. Like a lot of times we talk about the Taliban making all the profit from the drug war and that's how they're financing their operations, which is, I mean, he admitted that, but also like there's a lot of people, um, well, not a lot, but there are some people in the government and that they're, what he was saying is that they're making a bigger profit and that we can't ignore that aspect of it. And I think that's a really good point. We just didn't include it in the film. It just became like kind of a different story, but. Last okay. question. <laughs> I'm getting the signal. Anybody Do want the last ask question? Friend. So it's uh, absolutely amazing film. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so as a viewer, it's so absolutely gut-wrenching to see um, relapse mm -hmm. and worse and mm -hmm. death and hopelessness and chaos. And it's kind of like that scene where she shows up with all these bundles of food and yeah. not enough and then someone yeah. feeds them. Yeah. And that seems like a perfect microcosm mm -hmm. of the whole situation. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then it just fucking into disaster. How did you, yeah. How did you mentally get through that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, you know, I like. Like I said, I thought that the end would be a new beginning for her and this treatment center, and it would be like a really positive, beautiful thing, and that just didn't happen. And then I really thought Saeed Jamil, for example, was going to make it. Um, we were not ex like we thought Ikhtar Gul was going to make it too. Um, he didn't die of a relapse, as far as we understand, but we're not totally sure. Um, so yes, it was really wrenching. Like there was a lot of times I just was up crying at night, like thinking like, what, what can we do? Like we just felt so helpless and wanting to intervene, but not being able to really. And so this ending is like, we tried to actually make it hopeful. And I know it's like a really, <laughs> uh, but it was actually like initially, like that was a struggle in the edit. Cause I think that our editor was like, it was a lot more depressing. I'm like, no, we have to put like these little glimmers of hope into it. And I feel like that's kind of what the ending is for yeah. me, that it's this glimmer that it's like, she's still persevering. And that's what the takeaway is and that she's Afghan and she's on the ground. And, you know, the saving is not going to come from outside. It's going to come from in the country, you know, and she has the, her agency and she's doing it herself and she's not giving up. And it's just like that persistence, like Sisyphus with the rock, which is not exactly like a Hollywood happy ending. But, you know, we wanted to be realistic to the situation. But, yeah, I think the hope is really that that she's still doing it. And that, pe that people are, her brother's a success story, a success story Hakeem. 
he has remained uh, off of drugs to this day. Um, so that's like, I don't know how many years right now, five, six. Um, so there are people in that group who are still off of drugs. There's people that are still dying, but. Well, just to see her smile. Her yeah. smile is so positive and hopeful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's, she's pretty tough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you well, so thank much. Well, thank you. Thank Elizabeth. you for having me. Thank you. Thanks for all your questions.